Hello everybody, so thank you for joining me today and in today's video we're going to be looking at supraventricular tachycardia as part of the high yield ECGs edition. So just a little bit about the medicine guide. So the medicine guide is a YouTube channel with free online videos and it aims to help support medical students throughout their entire journey at medical school. So I've made videos on how to be successful at medical school and focusing particularly on anatomy, CBL, histology and PBL, as well as GP and hospital placements. I've also got a range of videos focusing on the high yield topics that crop up in final exams, such as imaging, an obs and gynae edition, a paediatrics edition, a cardiology edition, a neurology edition. And this video in conjunction with others will form part of my high yield ECG edition. So if you enjoy my video today and if you've enjoyed my previous videos, please can I ask you to give a thumbs up to my video and support my YouTube channel by subscribing. So without further ado, let's get started. So the outline of today's video is that we'll be looking initially at the different types of supraventricular tachycardia. Then we'll be looking at the signs and symptoms and afterwards the test investigations, paying particular attention to the ECG presentation because that's something that commonly crops up in final exams, as well as looking at the management. Now the management of supraventricular tachycardia as well as the ECG presentation of a supraventricular tachycardia is very high yield, so I would encourage you to pay attention very carefully. So let's get started. So a supraventricular tachycardia is essentially a tachycardia which is arising above the level of the bundle of his. So therefore, this type of tachycardia is arising above the ventricles. Now, there are different types of a supraventricular tachycardia and all of these will vary in terms of their specific origins. Now, just for completion, I've included the different types. So there's an AV nodal re-entry tachycardia, there's an AV re-entry tachycardia, and an atrial tachycardia. But I think it's important to be familiar with the different types and just to be aware of it. And just keep in mind that an AV nodal re-entry tachycardia is the most common form. Okay. So let's focus on the signs and symptoms of an SVT. So I'll give you 10 seconds starting from now just to jot down a few signs and symptoms that you think would occur in a patient presenting with SVT. Okay, so one key thing to remember about SVT is that SVTs often present in episodes and these episodes become more frequent and more severe as time goes by. So these SVT episodes, in other words, are recurrent and can be proxismal. They have an abrupt onset, an abrupt offset. The average duration of an SVT is typically around 10 to 15 minutes, but these episodes could last for any period of time. So they could last from a few seconds up until a few hours. But the key thing to remember is that the SVT episodes are recurrent and they have an average duration of 10 to 15 minutes. Finally, they've got an abrupt onset and offset. So with that in mind, let's focus on some of the signs and symptoms. So patients can present with palpitations. They can present with dizziness or lightheadedness. Patients often complain of a dyspnea, which is another phrase just to describe a shortness of breath, chest pain or tightness, progressive fatigue, and finally syncope. Now, in adults who present with an SVT, syncope is quite rare. However, when a syncope does present in these patients, it's often a warning sign because these patients have an increased risk of sudden cardiac death if they present with syncope in a known SVT patient. So that's something just to keep in the back of your mind. Now, a supraventricular tachycardia, so the clues in the name, these patients are in a state of tachycardia, 
So that means that their harsh rate or their pulse rate will be greater than 100 beats per minute. OK. So now let's look at the test investigations and in particular the ECG. So it is really important that you're quite familiar in picking out the key features of an SVT on an ECG because that's something that can quite easily present in both the knowledge paper and in your OSCEs and further on in your OSCEs they might probe you a little bit more by asking you more questions about the management of an SVT. So it's very important that you're comfortable in not only identifying an SVT on an ECG but also being able to discuss possible management plans. Okay, so I'll show you the ECG. So this is a very typical ECG of a patient with an SVT. So I'll give you 10 seconds to just drop down some of the key features that you can see and then we'll discuss it shortly. Okay, let's go through some of these features now. So one of the first things to realise is that these patients will have a regular rhythm and that's something that's very classic in an SVT. I mentioned it previously, these patients are in a state of tachycardia, so their heart rate will be greater than 100 beats per minute. Another thing to be cautious of is that an SVT on an ECG will often present with a, with a situation where the P waves are obscured by the T waves. So if you have a look at the enclosed blue circle, hopefully you can appreciate that. And finally, the fact that there is a narrow QRS complex, that's something that's also very significant and is very classic of an SVT. So I would say these are the four most common features that present on an ECG. And hopefully after watching this video today, you'll be a little bit more confident in picking out those key features. OK. So just to clarify, the key features on an ECG in a patient with an SVT involves a regular rhythm, P waves that are obscured by T waves, a narrow QRS complex, and obviously the fact that the patient is in a state of tachycardia. Now, something else to bear in mind is that we spoke about how these episodes of SVT are often quite episodic and have an abrupt onset and offset. So sometimes an ambulatory or halter monitor is another name for it, is used to identify these SVT episodes because, like I mentioned before, these SVT episodes are episodic and recurrent. Now, other possible investigations which could be performed involves an echocardiogram. Now, an echocardiogram in adults with an SVT is usually normal. The echocardiogram tends to be abnormal in paediatric patients who also have other congenital heart diseases. Now, an exercise testing is something that can be performed in patients. So in some patients, exercise can elicit an SVT episode, but in other patients, it doesn't. So therefore, exercise testing is an investigation which can be considered and it's not mandatory. So just be aware of that for your exams. But I would say definitely be confident with interpreting patients presenting with an SVT on an ECG because that's the most high yield investigation that you'll be asked about or be asked to discuss and interpret. And finally, we've got management. So the management of an SVT is divided into acute management and also prevention of SVT episodes. So we'll start off by discussing the acute management. So the acute management usually involves first line using vagal maneuvers. So examples of vagal maneuvers involves the valsalve maneuver and the carotid sinus massage. Now, if the vagal maneuvers have been unsuccessful and the SVT is still persisting, then we would consider IV adenosine. So initially, a six milligram dose of IV adenosine is used. 
if that's unsuccessful, we use 12 milligrams. And if that's unsuccessful, again, we would use a 12 milligram dose. Now, when we're using a 12 milligram dose of IV adenosine, it's important that we also ensure the patient is receiving continuous ECG monitoring. Now, adenosine is contraindicated in asthmatic patients. That's why Vrapamil is used. So that's a very important piece of information to remember for your knowledge exam. So IV adenosine is contraindicated in asthmatics. So therefore, in asthmatics, we would use Vrapamil. Now, I spoke about this in my previous high yield ECG video where I was talking about atrial flutter. Now, IV adenosine is quite important because normally the supraventricular tachycardia is terminated after using IV adenosine. However, if you use IV adenosine in a patient who is presenting with an atrial flutter, the flutter waves become more prominent. So if you're unsure about whether or not a patient is presenting with an SVT or an atrial flutter, IV adenosine can sometimes be used to help differentiate between the two. So IV adenosine in a patient with an SVT causes the SVT to be terminated, whereas in a patient with atrial flutter, the flutter waves become more prominent after using IV adenosine. And finally, we could consider using electrical cardioversion if all else fails. Now, one thing that you also need to remember is that patients who are receiving IV adenosine need to be informed that they may experience flushing, chest pain and shortness of breath for a few seconds after receiving the adenosine. OK, and now we're going to look at the prevention of SVT episodes. So we could use beta blockers and ultimately the definitive management to prevent any further episodes of an SVT would involve radiofrequency ablation. OK. So this marks the end of my video today. Hopefully you found it quite useful. If you've enjoyed my video today, please could I kindly ask you to subscribe to my YouTube channel and also please give me a thumbs up for this video. So I wish you all the best with your exams and thank you very much for watching my video today.